It's disturbing enough to find that the bad fish are swimming with the good ones, though we saw this very thing in the parables of the mustard seed and the wheat and tares. These bad fish can even be found within the nominal church, as Yahweh made all too obvious in his seven letters in Revelation 2 and 3. But there's more here than meets the eye, a subtle differentiation between two types of bad fish in this passage is totally lost in the English, a distinction that is important to our understanding of mankind's prospective eternal destinies. The fish that were characterized as bad are simply thrown away. By contrast, wicked fish are cast into the furnace of fire, where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. We ordinarily assume that these are the same souls, but they're not. The word translated bad is the Greek sapros. It means rotten and decayed, putrefied, decomposed, thus unfit and worthless. A fish that is sapros is dead, and judging by the stench, has been for some time. Wicked, on the other hand, is the Greek word poneros, meaning one causing pain, peril, and trouble, someone who is diseased, malignant, seriously faulty, evil, morally corrupt, vicious, even one who derives his wickedness from supernatural evil powers. Fish that are poneros are very much alive, and they're dangerous. Thus, there are not two, but three kinds of fish, the good, the lifeless, and the evil. And there are three corresponding potential destinies. One, eternal life with Yahweh, a very good thing. Two, death, a bad thing. And three, everlasting punishment, like that reserved for Satan and his demons, something infinitely worse than bad. Now, that may come as a shock, but as we'll soon learn, it's a theme that's as ubiquitous in Scripture as it is hard for us to see. In a way, this subject is a little like man's perception of the advents of the Messiah. In the first century, everybody knew that God's anointed one would come and fulfill all the messianic prophecies all at once, reigning in glory and subduing Israel's enemies. When the devout Simeon encountered the infant Yahshua, he referred to him, as Isaiah had, as a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of Yahweh's people Israel. We're still waiting for the second half of that, in case you haven't noticed. Some Jews of the time were vaguely aware of some suffering servant passages, but they misapplied them or simply ignored their significance because they were upsetting and inconvenient to their tidy little theologies. The idea that the prophecies could be fulfilled in two different advents, separated by thousands of years, occurred to practically no one. What's more, Yahshua didn't bother correcting our misperceptions. He gave us only the information we needed to live our lives day by day in reliance upon Him. In the same way today, our common Christian perceptions of an afterlife may be based on incomplete or partially understood information. A casual reading, in English, of any number of scriptural passages on the subject, like the one we just read, seem to indicate a simple choice between two alternatives, eternal life and eternal death. But how is this death defined? Sometimes death is characterized as eternal anguish, torment, a sharing in the everlasting punishment of the devil and his angels. On the other hand, it is far more often described as the destruction of the soul, a total cessation of life on a subcorporeal level, and it occurs to very few of us that these are mutually exclusive concepts. For the words of Scripture to have any meaning at all, there must be three possible doors, not just two, through which men pass after physical death. Eternal life, annihilation, or eternal conscious torment. Examining a few examples under the microscope will help us clarify the distinction. You have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. Isaiah 38.17 
The Hebrew word for corruption is bilai, which actually means nothingness. It's the word for negation. Literally, it means no or not or without. Isaiah is saying that by placing our sins out of his sight, Yahweh has saved our souls from becoming nothing, from dissipating into non-existence. He's quite clearly describing door number two. Or at least it's clear in the Hebrew, it's as fuzzy as a spring lamb in the English. Or try this. He who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Galatians 6, eight. Here in the Renewed Covenant, the word corruption is rendered from the word Phthora, meaning the destruction that is characterized by decay, moral corruption, or depravity. Paul's point is well taken. If one lives only to please his flesh, his destiny will be in kind. The body dies, decays, and returns to dust. A metaphor for what will happen to his soul. Again, door number two is being described. There is no mention here of divine retribution or wrath. God is not even said to be angry or upset. Corruption is merely the natural, inevitable result of choosing to live like a spiritless animal. Let's check in with Peter. The heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. 2 Peter 3.7 For our present discussion, we need to take a hard look at two words in this verse, translated judgment and perdition. Judgment is from the Greek chrysis, meaning a separation, sundering, or selection. Perdition, apoleia, means ruin, waste, loss, utter and eternal devastation, with the emphasis on eternal. Now, try to remember these Greek words. We'll run into them again. So, ungodly men are going to be separated and undergo eternal ruin. And as we'll see later in more detail, this separation is not between good and evil, but between the ungodly and the anti-godly. Those assigned to Chrysis, separation, are getting by far the better deal. Chrysis is door number two. Bildad prophesied in the book of Job... Those who hate you. In context, he's talking about the one who was blameless before God, a man of integrity, will be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked will come to nothing. Job 8.22 Here I believe we have a subtle comparison between doors number two and three. The Hebrew word for shame is boset, meaning shame, disgrace, or humiliation. The theological word book of the Old Testament reports that its root, boss, expresses that sense of confusion, embarrassment, and dismay when matters turn out contrary to one's expectations, as well as the disgrace which is the result of defeat at the hands of an enemy. Involved here are all the nuances of confusion, disillusionment, humiliation, and brokenness which the word connotes. But then, in contrast, Bildad turns around and says, in literal terms, the home or habitation, the tent of the guilty, those declared to be in violation of a standard of law, will not be. This last word is ayin in the Hebrew, meaning nothing, none, not, from a root connoting to be nothing or not to exist. Once again, we see the dichotomy between the dead and the damned. The enemies of Yahweh and his people will suffer shame and humiliation, things that require life and existence, while the merely guilty will cease to exist at all. Yahshua once asked one of the most significant questions of all time. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Luke 9.25 
Why were two separate negative contingencies listed? Because two distinct destinies were possible for the lost. The word translated destroyed is from apolomai, meaning to destroy, ruin, lose, disappear, or die. We should now be able to recognize this as door number two. And the contrasting word, zemiu, it means to sustain damage, receive injury, suffer loss, forfeit, or undergo punishment. No destruction, disappearance, or death is possible here. Zemiu requires one to be extant and conscious of his situation. It's door number three. The amazing thing about all this, at least to me, is how Yahweh can say something so many times and in so many ways, and we still don't get it. There are three post-mortal destinations, life, death, or damnation. The default is death. We must choose to receive either eternal life or everlasting damnation. In the context of the last days, that fact makes these next two passages really scary. First, If anyone worships the beast, that is, the Antichrist, and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead, or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the set-apart messengers and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends for ever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Revelation 14, 9-11 That warning applies to everyone alive on earth during the last half of the tribulation, when, as you'll recall, the mark of the beast will be instituted as a sign of submission to the Antichrist and his satanic world government. In order to avoid door number three, people will have to become outlaws, fugitives, rebels against the system. Many will pay for their convictions with their lives. A small price to pay, however, for avoiding eternal torment and gaining everlasting life. Second, Yahshua explained what will happen to those left alive at the end of the tribulation. They will be separated as a herdsman separates his sheep from the goats. And these, the goats, will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous, that is the sheep, into eternal life. Matthew 25 46. Why is this so terrifying? Because he has apparently ruled out non-choice, leading to door number two, as an option for these last hardy survivors. I realize it's an argument from silence, which makes it hard to be dogmatic, but it appears that by the time the king has taken his throne, no one on earth will still be sitting on the fence trying to ignore the world of spiritual things. No one will be merely wicked, marked for destruction. If by this time you haven't chosen to reciprocate Yahweh's love, then you will be counted as his enemy, actively engaged in the futile work of Satan. You won't have to be a theologian or serious student of religious things to demonstrate your choice, however. Your decision will be evident in how you treat Yahweh's people, especially the Jews, during this time of testing. Bless them, and God will bless you. Curse them, and it's door number three. That principle will have been in force for 4,000 years at this point, proven at every turn to be true, if only we'd pay attention to the consequences of our actions. You'd think we'd have gotten the hint.